Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, as Susan mentioned, this is the 150th anniversary of the Press Gallery. The first event in what's going to be a whole series of events uh, was a week or so ago, or last week on the yeah, Hill. So cool, right? And uh, but tonight we're going to talk about several things. We thought. Um, We'd start talking with the discussion a little bit of the book that's being produced that will be coming out in May, I think, Josh? That's right. In May. And, uh, and uh, our three panelists are all people who've written uh, sections of the book. So we'll ask each of them to talk a little bit about uh, their, what the work they've done on the book. Uh, then I think we'll ask them each to, to uh, talk a bit about what surprised them most in the research they did about the press gallery and uh, the early days and even the more recent days. And then finally, we want to open uh, the floor a bit and also have our panel talk a bit about some of the challenges and the issues that the press gallery faces at the moment in a particularly trying time for the media. And it's been a difficult time for the gallery in some respects, too. So I think some of the things they discovered may flow into that. And hopefully, we'll have some suggestions that we can throw out and that other people may uh, in the audience are welcome to. Uh, to participate as well. So having said that, I'll introduce our three panelists, and uh, not in the order in which they're speaking. Right beside me is Jennifer Ditchburn, who has spent about 20 years on, on Parliament Hill for uh, Canadian Press and also for CBC Television. Uh, recently just left, uh, uh, early in February, to go become the uh, editor of the now only online version of Policy Options which is put out by the Institute for Research on Public Policy. Uh, we've caught her in between jobs because she starts a new job on uh, March 7th. So um, we've got her tonight to reflect a little bit on, uh, on her time on the Hill working for, uh, working for CP and for CBC. Beside her is Josh Wingrove from uh, Bloomberg News, who uh, was a uh, graduate of Ryerson. And Sorry. That's OK. I was going <laughs> to. Um, uh, graduate of Ryerson, who coming out of Ryerson went to the Globe and Mail spent uh, most of his time at the Globe and Mail, and just about a year ago now went to, uh, went to Bloomberg, and has been working at Bloomberg News on Parliament Hill for the last year. And Josh also played a big role in the editing of the book that's coming out, and, and uh, we'll have something to say about all of that. And finally, uh, Janice Tibbetts on the end, who has, uh, who has been a journalist in Nova Scotia, in Alberta, and a lot of time on Parliament Hill as well, covering uh, Supreme Court, covering justice issues, for Canadian Press, Post Media, and, uh, and uh, left in 2011 to do a uh, master's at Carleton, as <laughs> Jennifer did as well, um, and then has been teaching at Carleton, Concordia, and now back at Carleton. So uh, with that as a bit of an introduction, why don't we start with Josh, who will talk a bit about the, uh, about the book and uh, the things he discovered in doing the work he did sure. on the book. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, taking questions about the future of the gallery, which I think when you'll put us all really on the spot, so be gentle for that <laughs> portion. Uh, but I will we'll go through the first bit now. I was one of the uh, co-editors of this book on press gallery history, which, as you can imagine, is a fairly uh, niche production. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, so we, uh, for a long time, the gallery's meaning to do this, but we never gotten around to it. So a group of us uh, have uh, all volunteered uh, to, to put it together uh, and uh, you know, it sort of goes, runs the gamut in what I hope is a mix of both sort of authoritative uh, historical uh, pieces as well as pieces that are, have a little more fun to them. Uh, so, you know, a little dessert with the vegetables, if you will. Uh, so, uh, like uh, Chris said, I'm a journalist with, with Bloomberg. Uh, I've been on the Hill not that long, actually, 2013. I was in Alberta before that, uh, covering uh, the absolute gong show that is Alberta politics, and federal politics <laughs> is no, no real different. Uh, in this research, I think, uh, we covered a lot of topics. There's about a dozen or so writers. Uh, Jen and Janice are two of them. And let me thank you both for enduring my many emails <laughs> uh, over the last several months. Uh, but it, it, it is really striking, I think, both ways how much, uh, just as an overview, the gallery has changed and how much it has uh, not changed. And I'm just going to turn off my phone because Susan is tweeting. Very well, <laughs> and it's beeping every time. To... That's so great. <laughs> that's, that's you know, meta. Meta, for sure. Uh, What's her first tweet? That's amazing. That's amazing. What did she tweet? Uh, the gallery has really changed a lot. Uh, Jen will show you photos earlier. I mean, the gallery as an institution is really not that old. But it used to be, of course, the reporters were early Hanser. Uh, the only way you knew anything, what was happening in the House of Commons in 1867, and even before that, uh, was what reporters wrote. And so as you can imagine, you know, the certain governments now like to talk about the liberal media or whatever, or the filter of the media. Uh, it was a lot worse back then. There was the only way you were getting anything out of there unless you attended in person was by, by the filter of the media. Uh, so that, that, has, that has changed a lot. The, uh, they used to, be, used to be a lot more hand in glove with government. It's really remarkable by today's standards. I mean, parties sat 
uh, and Jen will talk more about this, uh, journalists sat on the same side of the house that their party sat on. You were either a liberal paper or you were a conservative mm -hmm. paper. And you switch sides in the viewing gallery based on that. You know, that, that is unheard of today. You, you know, the, we're, <laughs> we're a little more subtle, uh, those of us, uh, if, we, uh, if we have a bias, we certainly, uh, I don't think, would admit it, and most of us would claim not to have any. Uh, so I think that, that is uh, true. On the fun side, I think there's a lot of things that have really uh, stayed the same. I can say that journalists have always been terrible athletes, like 100%. <laughs> we lose, go, going back a century, we lose to every MP so, sports team ever is assembled. Is there something we should know about It's that? remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Kelsey organized our softball team. It took us two years to win a game. Yeah, yeah, we were terrible. <laughs> that has always been uh, the case. Uh, journalists have also, I think, led the way uh, for better or for worse in uh, uh, booze consumption in Ottawa. I don't think there's any other way to put that delicately. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the, the parties na nowadays are like <laughs> night and day different. I mean, Twitter has really cleaned up Ottawa, as has televisions and the House of Commons. Like, it used to be just, uh, just, just wild from every... Every sense of, you know, Bob Fife is one of the guys interviewed for the book, and he arrived in the 70s and said, you know, there was a lot of drinking. There was a lot of drinking. I mean, there was a lot of drinking. You know, he, he, so several times had to emphasize, mm -hmm. uh, emphasize that. So I think gallery has evolved. It's certainly way more diverse linguistically, ethnically, uh, by medium than it ever was before. I, I don't think anyone would think that that is not a positive thing. The gallery is quite large, although it has been declining in size over the last decade or so which is, I think, a topic we'll talk about when we address the sort of future of the gallery. Uh, so those, those changes are positive. Of course, uh, you know, technology has really evolved the role of the gallery. You know, two newspaper publications, you know, two or three deadlines for one paper in a day used to be pretty pressing. And now, of course, with between Twitter and multimedia requirements and the web and whatever, journalists who are only filing two or three times a day are probably considering themselves having a light day. So, you know, things have really changed, and of course it leaves them less time to go get drunk with MPs. Uh, so, you know, that, that all hand in hand. So I think overall, it, this is a history that we're trying to celebrate. It's also one that has its uh, spotty moments that we're not trying to sweep under the rug. The gallery has made some questionable decisions in the past about uh, rejecting membership to people, which is obviously a way of stifling their ability to report. That included a Jewish publication in the late 1930s when we decided that there wasn't enough Jewish news in Ottawa to accredit them. Uh, these are not, you know, tremendously proud things, obviously, in retrospect, but this is a book that was not meant to put a positive spin on the gallery, although we, you know, joke in the chapter about drinking, like, you know, that's more <laughs> trivial. Uh, but, you know, we were trying to be open-minded. Gallery members were very complicit in uh, censorship in the war, which at the time was perfectly acceptable. We were, it was obvious that, of course, why would we, why, you know, of course we'd go, we'd report what the government told us to report, you know, we threaten the war effort, but in retrospect, that sort of government censorship would be just unheard of in today's days, uh, in today's era. So, you know, I think uh, looking back and seeing how, how things have evolved is, is, is really jarring and puts a lot of the same debates in context. One, in context. One final thing, one of the things we've done for the gallery book is pull together old political cartoons, which uh, obviously the more biting they are, the better. There's one from 1956, I believe. It's the House of Commons, or the, the center block in the Peace Tower uh, with a guillotine uh, drawn into the Peace Tower. And that was uh, a criticism, a very sharp criticism of a liberal decision in 1956 to cut off debate over a Trans-Canada pipeline. <laughs> so 60 years later, as we are gripped in debate over Energy East, it's amazing how things change and how they don't, how they don't change at all. So uh, yeah, that's my brief overview. I'm thrilled and humbled that you all came here tonight. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. If you want to chat after, that's great. And uh, I'll pass it over to Jen or Janice. Whoever. Jennifer, no, go ahead. How do, I became interested in the history of the gallery when I was doing my master's thesis, which was actually not, as Kirsten will tell you, <laughs> uh, was not on, um, on the gallery's history at all. It was about government news management. And, but part of my thesis was about uh, the history of the gallery and how the evolution of the gallery played into its relationship with the government. That was one component of my thesis. And so as I started doing research on, um, on the gallery's history, I kind of went down the rabbit hole <laughs> and uh, enjoyed it <laughs> and, um, and realized, well, one, there, no one's ever written a, a history of the gallery, which seems very surprising to me because there's one in Australia. There's two in Australia, two books on the history. There's one recent one in, in Britain, uh, which is quite good, a book about parliamentary reporting there, but nothing in Canada. Um, and so uh, in doing the research, I also realized that the gallery 
uh, doesn't date back to uh, Confederation. It uh, predated the Hill in the sense that the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Canada, which preceded the Dominion, Canada East and Canada West, which was Ontario and Quebec, uh, there were, they sat, if you don't know, if you forget your Canadian history, they sat in different places in Canada, so Kingston, Toronto, and Montreal, where they burned down the, <laughs> burned down the legislature in Quebec City. And so there were galleries in those different legislatures, but by the time they had their last sitting on Parliament Hill in 1866, so the buildings opened in 1866, they held that last sitting of the legislature, and that's when the reporters' gallery, or reporting on Parliament Hill, officially began. And, um, and so I think it, it, it's also important to note, though, that we don't know exactly when officially the press gallery as a, a formal institution began. Um, but in terms of reporting on Parliament Hill, 1866 is, is when it began, which is kind of cool because it predates Confederation. So what you see up here, uh, these are the very cool plans of the uh, Parliament buildings. And in the corner, there's a little box. I can't really point to it, but there's a box, and that's where the reporter's room was. And these plans are from 1859-60. Um, so clearly they had it in their minds that they were going to have space for reporters and space for a press gallery um, you know, even way back then, which is nice when you consider in Britain they fought tooth and nail uh, for reporters to be able to sit in the, in the press gallery there. Um, so this is uh, what um, Parliament Hill looked like in 1866. Uh, pretty, it was pretty ugly. <laughs> and um, reporters who came to Parliament Hill, uh, they had to fight with the rest of the members of Parliament for bad rooming house rooms in, in the city. There were lots of rats. People like, still had cows in their backyards downtown. Um, and uh, you can't see East and West Block, but they were there, and they were departmental buildings at the time. And so 1866 also, important to remember that just a week or less than a week before the, that last session of the Legislative Assembly, there was the big Battle of Ridgeway, which was the, the biggest of the, the Fenian raids. So um, do, do you guys remember the Fenian raids and the um, Irish Americans that were uh, waging so this skirmishes and border war um, into Canada? So um, when, when the reporters came up to Parliament Hill and the MPs, it was a heightened state of alert in Ottawa. Um, in fact, one of the first orders of business of that Legislative Assembly was to suspend habeas corpus. And um, there were troops in the streets and so on. So it would have been, and if you can imagine coming to work on Parliament Hill then, it would have been like quite a dramatic time. Uh, even the guns that would usually salute the, the, um, the governor general weren't there because they were being used at the front. And those actually, incidentally, those um, Fenian raids and the, the fact that Canadian soldiers were involved in staving them off, some people credit with helping to um, bolster the uh, desire for confederation or the or strengthening the case for confederation so anyway i'm going now i'm going down a rabbit hole there <laughs> um, so the gallery uh, back then obviously as, as josh pointed out um, you know it was all guys <laughs> and uh, they were very hyper partisan they um, were uh, you know you were if you wrote for the grit paper or the Tory paper, you were, you know, alternatively or alternately frozen out by the government. Um, but the government did allow reporters to to um, report from the from the gallery during those years. And um, uh, we also have don't have like a clear picture of who was the first president of the press gallery. But I find it interesting that the Montreal paper seemed to dominate um, the the gallery in those years. The Montreal Herald, the Montreal Gazette. Uh, uh, and um, papers in sort of this particular region were the ones that controlled the gallery for the first 20 some, some odd years. Um, and this, this is pretty cool if you ever get a chance to see it. Um, this is part of what they call the scrapbook debates. And so, as Josh mentioned, there wasn't um, any official Hansard. So some enterprising librarians cut out uh, the Ottawa um, Times and the Globe and pasted, in them, pasted them into these scrapbooks. And that is our official Hansard, basically, of those first years. And this, I, I took these pictures in the Library of Parliament. They have them in this special rare book section. But um, they later reconstituted those debates. It took them like a crazy amount of time, like 20 years 
of sort of melding together the different accounts so they could get like a, a sort of a global view of what, what the verbatim account was from 1867 to about 18, oh my, uh, about 1880, 80, 85, so somewhere around there. In fact, we had a Hansard in Canada before they had an official Hansard in the UK, which seems completely bizarre, but anyway, there you go. Um, this is sort of some pictures of uh, um, the early days. I think this one is from about 1883. Um, and, you know, one thing that I sort of explored in my thesis, this is the old um, House of Commons, and you can see the gallery member sitting above the speaker. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the things I, I touched on in my thesis, and I, I think it's kind of interesting, is that you consider the gallery and um, the MPs and all of them being in close quarters, and they drank together, and they dined together, and they played euchre together. And so they really had a, a shared culture. And um, there wasn't the same sort of adversarialism, I think, as there is now. It would have really taken root after the pipeline debate and so on. But um, you, you can kind of imagine that uh, you know, if you look at our, our gallery in the context of today and consider what, what's the, the impact of us not being as close, um, having that, uh, that proximity to the MPs as they did back then, I think there's, there's probably a, a big difference in how we approach the coverage because we're not all in each other's faces like we would have been back then. Um, that's the interior of the old press room, and that was taken, I think, like, it must have been a few weeks before the fire because the date on the photos is 1916, and uh, the fire was uh, February 3rd, 1916, so... It's very odd. This is from the University of Toronto archives. Um, and I, I included this picture because um, this is from our archives in the press gallery. This is from 1923. And let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight names down. You can say it says M Mrs. Lipset Skinner. And so uh, Genevieve Lipset Skinner was the first woman to gain membership in the press gallery. And this is them logging that she paid her five bucks to be a member. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> So it, it's, you see, from 1866 to 1923, it took that long for a woman to become a member of the press gallery. And the press gallery over the years was quite stubborn about stuff like that. So women, you know, women, and it was a fight over whether magazines could be in, and then it was a fight over whether broadcasters could be in the gallery, and then whether technicians could be in the gallery. That didn't happen until the 80s. But just like a short word about Lipset Skinner, because I think she's super cool. Um, she, <laughs> she's from Mani she was from Manitoba, and we, this year we celebrated 100 years of the vote in uh, a women's right to vote in Manitoba. And she was actually uh, uh, in that same group uh, of women that, that were um, working uh, on the suffrage movement and was at this famous play at the Walker Theatre in Winnipeg where they, they sort of destroyed the uh, premier, Premier Rod Roblin, in a, in a parody play. And that, that particular play sort of changed the tide in favor of women's suffrage. And so Lipset Skinner was one of the people that was involved in that play. She later made her way to Ottawa as a, re a freelance reporter. And the gallery wouldn't give her any um, membership because she was a freelancer, not a, an official correspondent. Um, so anyway, th that's, uh, that's a little overview of... <laughs> I have lots of little things in my head that we can talk about later, but... Um, and uh, I'll just leave you with one more photo of this woman, who I'll, I'll, I'll talk about later. So I came, back, I came at this from a point of view of a reporter who had covered the Supreme Court of Canada for 14 years. I caught wind of the book from uh, Jennifer mentioned it in passing when we were bowling with our children one day. <laughs> I thought, there has to be something about the Supreme Court of Canada in this book because it is it's probably it's the most overlooked part or coverage of the parliamentary press gallery, but I think a very important part and it's something that's near and dear to my heart so I wanted a chapter in so I contacted Josh. And I had about three days to do it, so I thought I'll just do a first person from memory. And he suggested gently that maybe some research might be in order. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> very politely in an email. So, it wasn't quite like so, that. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I did some research, and I found it just very fascinating. And I focused in the book on just one chapter on how the parliamentary press gallery, and when I say it's an overlooked part of coverage, I mean it. It's people that are 
on par reporters who are on Parliament Hill to cover politics. That's what brings them there. The Supreme Court is sort of a little aside to a lot of people. Uh, it shouldn't be. It's a very, very important institution. But I would be in news meetings. I remember saying, oh, I'm covering today a, you know, a ruling on whether parents can spank their children. They say, okay, keep it short because, you know, it's a, it's a busy day here in Ottawa in <laughs> politics. So that's how it was sort of an overlooked type of thing. But I thought it's not going to be overlooked. I hope, Hopefully, uh, Josh would agree to a chapter in the book. And I focused on something that a big achievement for the Parliamentary Press Gallery was getting the first pre-judgment lockups in the world uh, for journalists to actually see rulings and to understand them before they were released so they didn't have to sprint out of the media room at the Supreme Court of Canada and understand a judgment in about 12 seconds and go and report on it. It's something that it was, a, I think, a nine-year lobby effort by journalists and a gentle, persuasive lobby effort. It was not the least bit confrontational. It was something over time that the Supreme Court came around to. And when I say it's the first one in the world, that happened in 2004. The Supreme Court in the U.S. still does not have pre-judgment lockups. The Supreme Court in the US still does not allow television cameras in its courtrooms, where the, the gallery started in 1985 here to push for that. Uh, when I talk about gallery history, or when I talk about the Supreme Court of Canada history, I think of uh, the relationship between the two really just got its start. Although there was coverage before, it really just got its start 30 years ago because of this little thing called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which mm -hmm. suddenly made the uh, court a very high-profile institution. And there was a sudden interest in covering a court that got to adjudicate and be the final arbiter about rights. And what this did is it made, and within a year, they, hired, they start, opened a press room they hired a media liaison person, and they allowed for the first time television cameras in the courtrooms. It happened only on a pilot basis in the very beginning, and it took 10 years to get that, but it was just persistent and uh, persistent, I, I, I guess, lobbying on part of the Parliamentary Press Gallery, which is quite remarkable considering how few journalists actually cover the Supreme Court of Canada that are members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. I think of the 350 members, there's probably uh, less than half a dozen who do it uh, on a regular basis nowadays, and a lot just dip in and don't necessarily cover it from a thematic point of view. Those days are gone uh, for the most part. I know that it's covered, the Globe and Mail does it, the Lawyers Weekly does it, the Toronto Star does it a little bit, but for the most part, it's just covered on a case-by-case -case basis, which is a shame, but that's just sort of a casualty of cuts uh, in the industry. But uh, it's sort of... Uh, there have been, despite that, many accomplishments, I think, on the part of the gallery. and something I think that the gallery can and should be proud of, that they managed to get these things that are still considered like a model in the world. And like, so I, what I focused on really was the lockups and everything that went into uh, the negotiation of that lockup starting in 1995, where the Supreme Court uh, rejected the idea, saying that nobody should be able, they were worried about leaks pretty much, and they weren't convinced that it was going to help coverage at all. They just said, we do not want to risk, we've never had a leak before, and we don't want to risk anything getting out before the parties involved in the case get to know what the ruling is. But over time, they relented and agreed that uh, they don't have as much at stake maybe as politicians do, uh, where they're not elected, uh, they don't have the same type of agenda, maybe. They don't have as much reason or didn't at the time think they had as much reason uh, to what, what's the upside? What was the upside of this type of thing? But over time, they agreed that the upside is everybody benefits. The coverage is just better if journalists can have a look and read a decision for, it's not very long, something like an hour, and it's pretty much the same still. I haven't been there in the last five years, but pretty much the same. Just having that extra hour and being at least a little bit informed as opposed to not being informed at all. And it really was just before the first lockup in 2004, so we're 12 years in now, and it only happens on cases that are of national importance. and. The parties can veto it if they, do, if they want to, which is something the gallery is still trying to fight. They're saying that we don't, that we don't think that the, uh, that the uh, parties should have a veto on something that's of national importance. There the should party, be the parties in this case point. being the people the arguing, people. not yes. the political parties. Not the political right. parties, I'm sorry. That's the parties okay. as in the, yes, the, uh, the lawyers, okay, on both sides. 
So thanks. That's an okay. important clarification. <laughs> so well, particularly anyway, when you so, consider yes, when we're talking that politics, some yeah. past governments have had interesting relations with Chief Justice. <laughs> yes. <and the> so, <laughs> so anyway, so uh, so anyway, these lockups are just something that uh, still the gallery is saying we think that there's more to be done, but up until this stage, very pleased with what how it has gone, and. Uh, yeah, just uh, being able to write about something without uh, having to uh, learn about it in two, two minutes flat and run out of the door, which uh, people had used to have to do for years. So that's what I wrote about for the chapter, and uh, I found it all very fascinating. Let so, me add a little bit about that yeah. on a couple of things. Number one is a couple of the key people who were involved in that was the late David Viano, who was at the Toronto yeah. Star, who played a very big role in that, and also Stephen Binman, who uh, mm -hmm. is now working for the government of Canada. Yeah. Um, and... It was interesting. I was involved in organizing a conference last spring looking at how media and Supreme Courts deal with each other across a whole bunch of countries. Mm -hmm. And it was in Banff, Alberta, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. And Susan Herada came in and she did the paper about, uh, about Canada. And what I didn't realize until I got to the conference was how far ahead Canada was on so mm -hmm. many things Absolutely. as it related yeah. to media and the courts mm -hmm. in terms of the ability to, to speak with justices and, and, and the... I mean, I think I, I was... Janice reminded me I was at some of the meetings where we yes. debated oh. with the court about that. Yes, I have Chris's name on, uh, I won't say how, like, the, you know, typewritten letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. it was, I think, on Sorry. a couple, yeah. But um, the other thing I was going to say is, is um, Janice's note about, about court and, and the Supreme Court and reporters that covered the Supreme Court. CBC Television used to have someone who was assigned to do courts mostly, a woman named Vicki Russell, for a while. Um, but that was in an era, some of that was in an era when um, CBC Television, just television had 14 reporters on Parliament Hill. Um, they don't have 14 reporters today. Um, that's one of the big changes that's gone on. And, and I guess, Josh, in looking through the book, you would have seen. Um, that's a theme in pretty much every chapter and will be the dominant theme in our discussion later about where the gallery goes. I mean, the business models are just changing so rapidly. Print for the last eight years or so, broadcast really only the last three or four ish years uh, have they really started to feel the uh, the pain that print has been feeling that is just it, it is such an overwhelming force in our lives right now that you know as the country grows the gallery shrinks and as you know I've been in these Supreme Court lockups mm -hmm. recently it is about an hour it is so helpful and there were maybe eight of us in the room um, which is a far cry from even I think there were 26 reporters for the first lockup and there would routinely be at least well more than a dozen yeah so mm -hmm. for sure and on the really big ones, I remember there was a lockup for as a trial project uh, way back for the Quebec secession reference. And there were probably about 50 or 60 journalists in the room for that. But that's the crossover of politics, and that's a little bit different. Right, sure. Because that's when sure. you get the big yeah, and I was And I was also involved in battles with the Department of Finance mm -hmm. about uh, budget lockups, too, mm -hmm. which is when, we, when could we get in, when could we get out, when could we... Uh, uh, there seemed to be a giant fear that we would run out of the building and start screaming things on, yeah. on uh, Wellington Street and be shot by the police or something like that. But we ultimately <laughs> negotiated it, but it took a long time because the government was concerned that the Minister of Finance, if we let, if we let journalists out too early, might die on the way down from mm -hmm. the Prime Minister's right, office yeah. down to the, uh, the Commons. And we finally accommodated, reached an agreement that once the Minister stepped inside the door, we could start to report, of the commons, we could start to report and we could start to do things because otherwise they were afraid he might not get there. And now it's so. you got to wait till he starts his budget speech. But right. he stands up to table the budget and then there's like 10 seconds and then he stands up for his speech and it is the most just stupid, although, although, it's like, yeah. just like, oh, did he, oh, no, not that stand up, it's ridiculous. Although but. hopefully Mr. Morneau's actions in the last few weeks will be the start of ending all of the... <laughs> And a budget lockup and Openness just release, and all, just release everything. Yeah. Jennifer, what was the in in the work that you did of the early days and all your chapters in the in the book? What was what surprised you most? What were the things you didn't know or realize? Uh, well, one of, one of the things was the, the gallery's archives, which I I think most gallery members don't even realize that there's mm -hmm. all these boxes in the gallery of old papers and letters from Mackenzie King and and that you saw that la ledger that I. Um, took a picture of the names of the gallery members. Uh, there's stuff about censorship. There's, there's stuff from throughout the war. You can see you know, the development of debates um, over different uh, issues over the gallery's years if you go through the, all the boxes, and they're voluminous. And it's a shame that, um, you know, that somebody hasn't mined them <laughs> um, all these years. But um, I did a chapter on women in the gallery, and that was a particular interest to me. 
And what, one thing that I was um, quite shocked about was not necessarily that there were so few women in the early years, because there were a sprinkling. So before Genevieve Lipsett at Skinner, there were about three or four that came to report mm -hmm. to Parliament Hill. Um, and they were all very, very accomplished women. But what shocked me was that uh, if you look into the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, there were about a, a consistent number of women, a low number, so like three, four, five, all the way to the mid 70s. And so it, it, that I found. And most of them would have been print, obviously. Um, most of them would have been print. And so in the 50s, you had uh, Tanya Long, who was a war correspondent from the New York Times. You had a woman from uh, the Swedish paper, a Swedish paper. Um, you had, and I don't know if her picture is still up there. This is one of the happy um, bits of my research was that I came across um, this woman. Her, her name is Helen Brimmel now, uh, but her name was Helen Bannerman. And she's still alive, but she's 95 now. But she was the third woman to receive uh, gallery membership, and she worked for the Canadian Press starting in 1946. And so she had great stories. She worked for most of her career for the Guelph Mercury, right. which is no longer, um, and so did her husband. But uh, she had um, some really great stories, and one of them, if, if you'll allow me to share sure. it, sure. She, she said that uh, she got her press pass, and I, I found the, the log in the, in the books where they, they said Helen Bannerman you know, is a member of the gallery. But once she got her, her pass, she marched up to the parliamentary restaurant, which is up on the, the top floor of the uh, parliament buildings, and she went to sit down to have lunch by herself, and the, the manager came out and said, I'm sorry, ma'am, you're going to have to go leave and go down to the cafeteria, at which point she put down her pass, and the manager was taken aback and <laughs> apologized profusely and, and let her eat there, and she said it was one of the happiest days of her life. <laughs> you can imagine in 1946 there would have been hardly any women at all um, in, the, in, the, in the whole building, I mean, unless they were in the, in the speaker's gallery or so on. So, the um, food there is not exceptional. <laughs> it wasn't that just that she was suddenly she could get George? access to yeah. the best food yeah. in the world. Oh, well, yeah. she, was, she was married to George, uh, George Morrell, who, who is... Among other things, I happen to know his son, but, um, but among other things, he's most famous for being the reporter who broke the story about the Diefenbunker in, uh, out in Carp, in the, working for another defunct publication, the Toronto Telegram at the time, I think. Mm -hmm. but, but that would be in the um, late 1950s, early 1960s, when, well, when Diefenbaker was still a, the prime minister, so it would have had to have been before 62 or 60. I forget, was it a minority in 62? Paul, do you know? Yes. Okay, so 60 to 63, around there. But the other thing that's interesting in, in the earlier period that you talked about, too, is if you go back to the war period, people like Grant Dexter, who was the columnist for the Winnipeg Free Press, Bruce Hutchison, some of those people were actually writing speeches for Mr. King mm -hmm. and had a very much closer relationship with government than actually exists. One of, <laughs> one of our pieces on the history right. of uh, Francophone members of the gallery who've been comparatively until sort of the last generation or two a pretty small uh, number uh, in the gallery, uh, but they uh, there was a huge scandal in the late 1800s that many of them were doing double duty as either uh, uh, translators or you know government officials, basically working in some form in the Commons and running newspapers and writing opinion pieces <laughs> uh, or owning newspapers or what have you, and it was this just five alarm scandal, and they called they ended up calling one of the reporters to the bar of the House of Commons. This only happened, I believe, once. This one case. Uh, which is like, you know, basically a reprimand and because he was doing double duty and they didn't know whether to punish, it was, you know, very Ottawa, you know, bureaucracy stymied Ottawa from day one. They didn't know, do we punish him as a reporter or do we punish him as, a, as an employee? You know, we, don't, like, we don't know which rules he's broken here. And they basically slapped him on the wrist and let him go, but after making a big show of it, and it just goes to show the, the, the revolving door back then was remarkable, you know, notwithstanding the Wallens and Duffies and less Wallony and Duffy -y people, uh, as of late, who've gone from journalism to politics, uh, you know, it, it was it was absolutely a revolving door back then. Well, the, the, and the first three presidents of the gallery, and it's confusing to know when <laughs> the order of them, because they're different accounts, but um, Arthur Goff Penny became a senator, Thomas White became a minister, and then Douglas, Douglas Brimner, who was the third, became the chief, the first chief archivist of the government of, uh, of Canada. So th the revolving door went all the way into cabinet <laughs> and into senior positions. 
Which I, I never thought that was all that shocking when people go into government, but um, maybe I'm... <laughs> that has <laughs> been consistent. Maybe yeah. I'm in well, the minority. I, I think the issue may have been working for government will... Supposedly not, as right. Josh noted. Yeah, and it, and there's it's a little funny. bit of a conflict there. Yeah, yeah there's a, and the, the gallery has uh, its constitution, its rules have, have long sort of prohibited people from doing that. Um, there is a early record from 1874 where it says the gallery met and they discussed their rules, and one of them is you cannot be a public servant <laughs> and work for the gallery. So they had the you know some sort of standards going back a long time, but. I don't know, it seems that they were a bit weak. <laughs> Gal gallery membership used to be very closely tied to physical space in the gallery. Cameras only showed up in 1977, so of course the only way you could tell what was going on in the House of Commons was to actually sit in the House of Commons and watch it. So when I mean, made reference to the, uh, the Jewish news reporter uh, that was declined, one of the reasons they gave was they had 38 memberships already and only 40 seats, and they, wouldn't, they didn't find it prudent to spare one of the remaining two seats for this journalist. Um, which, in retrospect, to me seems like an exceptionally flimsy excuse, but that's the excuse they used at the time. As things change, as broadcasters arrive, things really changed in the gallery, and particularly in 1977. Now, you know, they didn't have to sit there anymore, so the gates, the floodgates could open a lot. Uh, it also changed the hot room, which uh, many of you will know or, or not, is the room in center block where journalists work. It is the messiest room you will find in center block by a mile, but it used to spill out into the, it was uh, the fire marshal apparently every year came to just lose his mind because it <laughs> spilled out into the hallway, was jammed with people, like smoke, they were running a speakeasy out of it, they were selling, they were selling booze at a markup to the speaker, like it was just insane, they, like tobacco, chewing tobacco, <laughs> they would spit into the wire papers, people have to fit, gross, it's horrible. Anyway, so it used to be a totally bizarre place. It was very insular and focused geographically in you know, a very tight area of center block, the, the gallery and the hot room right next to it. Now it's more diffuse, and you have very few people working in, in the hot room. You know, I, I don't work there. Jen didn't uh, work there. Uh, and you have very few people on a given day uh, in the press gallery actually watching it, which some of our older members, Courtney Tower, who I believe is 84, 85 years old, is a current gallery member, our, our elder statesman, really laments this. He says, you, we've totally lost the ability to tell which ministers are good, frankly, and which ones are, are, are lacking, uh, because we watch question period, and they play to the camera, and we don't get to see the sort of interaction. We can't tell who's watching. We can't, you know, because the camera has to either be on the speaker or be on uh, who's speaking. That was a huge issue at the time. TV cameras were supposed to be electronic hansard, and so when things that were embarrassing happened, the cameras were told to look away. Uh, so, uh, so in 1985, when Jim Fulton, uh, the famous salmon, the salmon, yeah, he smuggled a dead salmon in his I was pants <laughs> into the House of Commons. Uh, the salmon, Why? I swear to God, was this. They made yeah, some. Mulroney large. had made some change to fisheries laws that this, okay. this yeah. BC and yeah. he was not a fan of, to the point that he was willing to smuggle a dead yeah, salmon okay. in his pants, and he so he has the floor and he's speaking and he holds he like you know he's talking about the fisheries change holds up this giant salmon and the house loses it, everyone is like you know but he but he still has the floor so the cameras have to stay on him. And this caused, again, a giant, very Ottawa bureaucratic, like, oh my god, what's going on? Uh, but then he left his desk to cross the floor and put it on Mulroney's That's right. desk. Uh, either Mulroney's or Mazankowski's. There's a great well, historical well, debate other, was, yeah. over who, you yeah. know, who's, who had more of the fish. Uh, and, um, again, very Ottawa. And, uh, and, and so the minute he, uh, he left, he'd, he'd seated the floor. And so all you see is the, uh, the camera goes on the speaker, and you see the top of his head kind of going under, and the murmuring of people having the most exciting moment of their life. That has loosened now, but still you see them turn away when... It's still pretty rigid. In it terms is. of, in oh, terms yeah. of, uh, of not really seeing much of what's actually going mm -hmm. on in the rest of the chamber. Which is why when it catch, happens to catch in a cutaway shot, they've added cutaway shots to help with editing, right. and that's when a cutaway yeah. shot, Leona Gluka reading the newspaper when mm -hmm. they were debating right. uh, food security in Nunavut, and that became a huge uh, problem for Leona Gluka, mm -hmm. one of more than one problem for Leona Gluka. Uh, so it uh, you know, became an issue. So they, they, they've loosened it, but it's still very strict. We had, we had a, just making me think, in, at CP, we had this photo that I wish I could, could find it and uh, 
somehow put it on Twitter, but even though it's illegal. <laughs> but uh, one of our photographers years ago, there was um, a debate with, uh, over, I think it was the billion dollar boondoggle with Jane Stewart, who was uh, the head of, uh, the Minister for Human Resources. And um, this was going on every day in question period. It was, she, she was being challenged about the, the billion dollar HR bo boondoggle. And one of our photographers, just for the heck of it, took a picture of Gilles Duceppe, who was listening to her, and, it, and his face was like this. Oh, like, you know, <laughs> and it was like in complete frustration with what she was saying, but it was a, a dynamite picture, but we, it could never be published. It was just for our own personal amusement. You know, like occasionally it would be put up on the billboard or something like that, yeah. but lots of photos like that. One of the photos in the book was an off-the-record photo taken mm -hmm. of Pierre Trudeau taunting the media on his campaign plane, as Pierre right. Trudeau was wont to mm -hmm. do, but it was off, everything on the plane was off the record. And so honest to God, in the photo, he's doing this. <laughs> to the reporters, and they took a photo of it, but it, they couldn't release it until after his death, which seems a little oh. dicey, but it's been mm -hmm. released yeah. since, so it's one of the photos. Mm -hmm. Josh, how's, maybe before we switch the conversation, talk a little bit about the future of the gallery. How's the book structured? Is it chronological? Is it, what, what eras get a lot of attention? Are there eras that don't get much attention? Or? Uh, I mean, like any journalist, I wish I had four times as much space, you know? Uh, there's this, this sort of a black humor sort of saying, uh, that I learned very early on in journalism uh, called uh, kill your babies, which is a like phrase for you really like that line, but it's not going to make the cut. You filed right. 1,400 mm -hmm. words and I need 300. Mm -hmm. Like, get over yourself, you know? <laughs> uh, and everyone's like, no, it's, they're 1,400 amazing words. Uh, so we're in a similar boat here. We have uh, about uh, 18 or so chapters that run the gamut, uh, in, both in English, all, all of them in English and French. Uh, so uh, I think about 150 pages. So you can imagine the like crowbar job that we are working with to make it readable and not eight-point font. Right. right? Um, so yeah, I mean we'd like to have w way more on it. I mean Jen, Jen, the longest piece is Jen's on the early years, which covers 80 years of history, I think so. 60 yeah. years, and is you know maybe 3,000 words or so. Right. You can imagine. How you have to briskly go through that, you know. Ten words a year. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nothing happened in 1880 to 1900. <laughs> it was a boring year. Just blow by. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we uh, you know we, uh, we we wish you know we always wish we would have more. And the rest is organized around issues, or is it? A, yeah, it's, it's chronological uh, loosely. You know, we talk about. Uh, the impact of the fire on the gallery. We talk about, uh, there's, like, as I mentioned, a, gal a section on like um, fun stories from the gallery, including the gallery dinner. The press gallery dinner is a big event uh, and used to be a bigger event. One journalist woke up uh, in, in sort of have, after having slept off his evening and found himself in a third floor cabinet minister's room, panicked because he wasn't supposed to be there, jumped from the window, broke both his legs, was found by RCMP and taken to the hospital. So, when was uh, that? that well, <laughs> now you're testing was me. Davey Fulton's uh, office? I, it would have been around there, yeah. It, I, it would have been the 50s or 60s. It was in uh, one of the memoirs. So we, we had that. Uh, the, uh, you know, the technology has changed the gallery. It's a, little bit, it's a big section with four chapters on technology. We've asked for submissions. We got, uh, there's three submissions, uh, one from Paul Martin, one from Kim Campbell. Uh, and one from uh, Jim Munson, who's a current senator, former Chrétien director of communications, and a former jour longtime journalist. Um, uh, Kim Campbell uh, is uh, was interesting. She fa she uh, s today still and at the time views the gallery as a very conservative, uh, small c uh, organization that uh, doesn't like change, and she felt that she had a barrier as a female leader, political leader, prime minister, uh, in encountering a gallery of longtime mm -hmm. journalists who've been here you know, long time, and in her view, maybe a little too long a time. Uh, and, and they, you know, she didn't look like what they thought a leader was, and she thought she had an uphill battle. Uh, you know, I think historians might offer a slightly different take on what Kim Campbell's electoral problems proved to be. Uh, <laughs> but that, that was her take. And uh, Paul Martin uh, wrote about how he um, uh, always liked the photographers. They didn't... <laughs> If the journalists were fine, like the uh, written journalists were fine, but the photojournalists, they were the ones he, uh, he liked to, to have fun with. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've tried to give a mix. There's an oral history in there where there's a section of sort of interviewing uh, people. And there's, you know, between uh, myself, Hélène Buzetti of Le Devoir as my co-editor, and the uh, Fred Chartrand of uh, uh, CP, retired CP. Well, he's very bad at retirement. He works all the time. Yeah. Uh, is the photo editor. And so, yeah, it's loosely structured chronologically. As I said, it's a book of history, so it doesn't really tackle the where do we go now question, but it looms over everything.